Welcome. Shalom, shalom. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> Just wait for more of our friends to be informed of our really important class today. Okay, good morning everyone. Thanks for joining us, or good afternoon. Today's discussion uh, is all about self-esteem. Loving yourself, we'll see some amazing ideas and thoughts and stories and how the challenge in today's society, when I say today I mean uh, for the past 40, 50 years probably, has gone considerably worse and become more of a challenge of people seeing greatness in themselves. Self-esteem, self-worth have become, from my estimation of my reading, studying, counseling, rabbinic work, have become chronic and debilitating. Chronic means that self-esteem, low self-esteem, has become extremely widespread and extreme in and of itself and debilitating that it is stopping a lot of people finding their true potential. This is one of the great shames and challenges that I'm not sure if chronic low self-esteem existed in the past. We're going to see actually stories from scriptures. It seems like they did, but people not loving themselves, seeing tremendous power, significance, achievement in themselves and about how much they do actually achieve is going to be and is a big, big problem in today's society. And what I want to finish with today, which I did promise in the title, is one simple life hack to improve your self-esteem. Okay? But we're going to have to get there. There's a little bit of work until we get to that point. I start out by saying that people nowadays don't seem to love themselves, don't like to spend time with themselves, because if you don't like you, why would you want to spend time with yourself and only yourself? We all suffer from this. You get into your car, and the first thing we're doing is putting on the radio, putting on the music, listening to something, trying to call someone, We've got to a point where spending any time with ourselves has become an unpleasant experience. I mean, just the thought of driving for a man of time by yourself in the car without any other distractions, no eating, no phone, no radio, no music, no classes, no matter what it is. For many people, they'd rather die than do that. Why? Because spending time with me, who am I? What have I done? I'm low. I don't produce anything. I have no competence. I have no self-worth. Why would I spend time with me? I have a friend who was given a voucher for a uh, experience, which just the thought of this makes me well, shiver. But one of these tanks of deprivation you go into, Basically, you lie in the dark, in body temperature water for half hour. It's sensory deprivation. And you just lie there, no distractions, no music, no sound, no light, no smell. You can't feel anything because the water is body temperature. And my friend said this was meant to be a 30-minute session. There's actually a few of them. The first one was 30 minutes. The others are going to be longer. So there is my friend. He's given this gift. <coughs> he takes the voucher. He gives it in. And he gets undressed. And he's lying naked in this tank in the dark of water. He said 
he went, this is a, an accomplished individual, by the way, a successful and accomplished individual. He sat there for three to four minutes. He said, I'm going out of my mind. I got to get out of here. I cannot handle being in here. His mind was running and racing and he couldn't take it. He had to get out and he got dressed. He started to walk out and then he's like, where are you going? He says, I can't do this. You know, I'll come back next time. She's like, no, no, you can't move on to level two until you complete level one. <laughs> You're going to have to complete 30 minutes before you can move you on. There's stages, there's gradations. Uh, it's like a degree, right? You can't get to course 102 until you graduate 101. He's like, I could not handle it. He goes, I never went back. I said, why not? I said, just lie there. Half an hour, naked in the water. Just, he's like, I can't do it. Why not? Lack of self-worth, being with myself. And if I don't love me, why would I want to spend time with me? It's a very, very important question. But it's a fair question. What is the root? What is the premise that a person should have good self-esteem? Now, this is not a talk on humility. That was a talk I gave a week or two weeks ago. Humility, we said, is a very important trait. But humility and low self-esteem are two completely different topics. A person can be extremely humble and yet believe they are great, amazing, and a fantastic contribution to the world. Moses was described as the humblest, the Torah, the Bible, describes Moshe Rabbeinu Moses as the most humblest person who ever stepped foot on the earth. And yet, if you were to ask Moshe Rabbeinu Moses, tell me, are you great? He wouldn't be like, oh, me, I'm a nothing. I'm a shmata. People walk all over me. He'd be like, yeah, I spoke to God face to face. I was the greatest prophet that ever lived. He actually wrote the words. Moses' prophecy is the greatest prophecy of any prophet. Past, present or future. And at the same time, he also wrote, I'm the humblest person. Humility is, I know I'm great. I have an amazing purpose. I have a nishama. I have a soul. There's something great. I have been given a mission, a unique mission that I've been given with my life. There's room for improvement. And I've been blessed by God with a lot of talents that allow me to do this. The two are not contradictory. They're not mutually exclusive. You can have great humility and you can have very good self-esteem at the same time. And yet, we've seen psychologists will all tell you over the past 30, 40, 50 years, why is a big discussion we can have another time, have seen this great debilitating and chronic low self-esteem, this disease that has spread throughout, especially the younger generation, right? And people that I deal with as well. I'm a big follower of a psychiatrist and rabbi, hopefully you've heard of him, Dr. Abraham Tversky. Abraham Tversky is a rabbi, very learned one of course, and a psychiatrist and started a addictions counseling center many, many years ago, decades ago in Pittsburgh, I believe. He also has written, at this point, hundreds of books, religious and secular as a rabbi, as a doctor on addictions, whether it's gambling, whether it's relationships, whether it's food, eating alcohol, he's the expert, he's the go-to person. He's very elderly and we wish him well. And I once spoke to him and I met him and I said, is there any one theme that all your books are really about? Your religious books and your secular books? Because his books are held in very high esteem by many, many people. And he says, you know what? All addictions come down to one thing. All addictions and all my books, he says, have one theme. Low self-esteem. This is the connecting tissue that brings all destructive self, which addictions are, right? Food and alcohol and drugs and gambling. All of them are self-destructing behavior. A person will not get involved in self-destruction if they see themselves as special. He tells a story which goes together with this. A young lady who had been 
using drugs her entire life. Actually, she had injected herself so many times with heroin that she didn't even have veins that were viable to put drugs into. I mean, she was covered, her arms were covered in wounds from years and years. Her nose had caved in from cocaine use. And she was sitting with Dr. Tversky. And I heard the story from him live. It's a very, very powerful story and a sad one at the same time. And he was talking about this idea of the connection between self-destructive behavior and chronic low self-esteem. And he was talking, and the woman just wasn't getting it. She couldn't see the correlation between the two, between people who abuse themselves with alcohol, food, drugs, sex, and all the stuff that is self-destructive, and we know it's destroying us. He couldn't, couldn't get a mind connected that that's connected to her chronic low self-esteem from all the events that happened to her in her life. And while he was talking to her, he says, well, what's around your neck? And she said, it's a, a necklace. It was a pendant that was given to her by her grandmother. And he said, can I, can I see that pendant? And she's like, uh, sure. So she took it off her neck and she gave it to the psychiatrist and he looked at it. And then he opened a drawer and he pulled out a, a small pocket knife from the drawer. And it looked like it was about to stab her. She's like, no. She goes, what are you doing? He's like, well, what's the problem? She goes, what are you doing? Why would you, why would you cut into my pendant? This was a gift. He says, so what's the big deal? She says, that's mine. I love it. It was given to me by my grandmother. Don't damage it. And he's like, listen to what you're saying. He says, you see the inherent importance in this item, this piece of jewelry, this piece of physical animate object that was given to you. So you don't want any scratch to come to it. You, however, are way more important than this small piece of gold, this small piece of jewelry. Why would you hurt yourself in this way? It must be, ergo, that you don't see yourself as an important being. Because if you did, you wouldn't damage yourself. It's a deep and very powerful illustration. Every person, says the Torah, was made B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God. What does that mean, the image of God? Many answers to this question. But in a central way, we know that animals were not made in the image of God. Angels were not made in the image of God. The only things that were made in the image of God, the only creature, the only beings were humans. And God, as it were, we're told, breathed into Adam and Rishon a breath of life. There's a little bit of God inside all of us. And we are made B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. That alone should make us special. One of the great rabbis from the last generation says, if we understood how special we were, how incredible our potential is to make change in this world, how latent and how underappreciated we make of ourselves and how incredible we really are, that we have a little bit of God inside us, there wouldn't be any low self-esteem ever again. If we just appreciated how incredible and amazing we are. But people don't like themselves because if you see yourself as just a physical lump of meat walking around, like any animal, then what's the big deal? And yet we're given an neshama, we're given a soul. And the low self-esteem that we're talking about is not coming from the body, it's coming from the neshama, from the soul. Because the soul is under attack all the time. It's under attack from people and images and things we see around us all day every day which for the past 40 50 years has become extremely prevalent in our society that everyone is perfect and everyone is good and of course the advent of social media has multiplied this infinitely as everything we see is perfect and manicured and good and clean and straight and life isn't Life isn't smiling and constant happiness. It's challenge and there are ups and downs. And we don't get to see that in the billboard. And we don't get to see that in television shows. And we don't get to see that in movies because they usually end up good at the end. And we don't get to see that 
on social media, Instagram posts, because it's all shiny and nice and bright, but that's not the reality. So outside we're getting this, but also on the inside, we're constantly, our negative inclination is constantly fighting us. We are constantly being challenged from inside and that is something which is holding us back from being who we went to be. So when we talk about self-esteem, we're actually talking about two things. Number one, good self-worth. Feeling and understanding that we are great and that we have a godly potential inside us, which is as infinite as God is. There is no limit to the amount of amazingness that we have inside us. Everyone. Because every human was made in the image of God. And number two is competence. Good self-esteem is based upon us realizing that we are competent and we have the ability to achieve greatness. And we have skills that no one else has. And our souls are unique to us as our faces are unique to us, says the Gemara. Just as two faces don't look the same, so too, no two souls and two soul missions are the same as well. Everyone has a unique soul mission that is unique to them. There are things that you, you yourself can do that nobody else can do. Now there's people are going to be better looking than you. And there's people who are better runners and dancers and mathematicians and parents. But did you know that the fact you're alive means that you have a soul mission that is unique to you, that only you can bring to this world and no one else can do. That's an amazing thought. That alone should fill us with a feeling of good thought. You know, there was a, um, an interesting statistic I learned in university, actually, <laughs> in a sociology course I took with a professor called Professor Wright, as he used to say, I'm right, but never wrong. And... The fascinating statistic is, what would you think the rates of suicide would be during wartime? Imagine you're living in, I don't know, Germany. Maybe you're living in England, right? Or America, although we haven't seen many wars actually here on the shores of America. But in England you did, and this was a study that was actually conducted in England during the Second World War. And they noticed that there was a Opposite effect to war. You would have thought that suicide rates would go up at a time of the Second World War when England is being bombed every day, London is being bombed, and a chance of being killed, having his miserable death during the Second World War was greater. And yet they found, statistics were, that the opposite was true. That during the Second World War, suicide rates plummeted, went right down. And when the war finished, they went up again, almost to previous levels. And the sociologists noticed this because they look at effects on society. But the psychologists came with a very interesting possible answer for this reverse intuition of suicides going down during the Second World War. You see, during the Second World War, terrible things were happening and people were going through tremendous challenge and difficulty. But when you have difficulty and challenge, suddenly you find purpose. We have a joint mission. What's that? To to defeat the Nazis. And everyone felt that. There was a unity that didn't exist beforehand. And when you have a purpose in life, you have a reason to live. And if you have a reason to live, why would I take my own life? So from this, we can kind of see an interesting pattern. If you feel a purpose in your life, if you feel as though you're something bigger and larger than yourself, you've got good self-esteem. You feel good about yourself. You have a purpose in life and suddenly life is worth living. You have something to contribute. You're part of a a greater collective, a greater good. In that case, get rid of the Nazis. And suddenly the individual wasn't, suddenly we're like together and we feel this unity. So unity is going to be one of the secrets that is going to improve self-esteem. 
having friends, having a purpose. I mean, during Corona, how many people felt disconnected? And you got to say, reach out, right? Make friends, do something, get actively involved. That's going to definitely improve our self-esteem. It's not today's secret, by the way. The secret of self-esteem we're going to do a little bit later. It's something you're not going to see coming. But it's definitely very important. And so we have a mitzvah. Because life is precious. And life is a gift. Every moment of life. We Jews are obsessed with it. Shortening your life by a moment is seen as a terrible, terrible thing. Every little life of moment of life you can break pretty much every law in the Torah just to extend a person's life, extend a person's life by a single moment. That's how precious we see life. We're going to see more about that later on. And if life is so precious, we see that you having self-esteem and realizing that you have a mission, a purpose of life is also crucial. And that comes from recognizing you have a unique and special soul. Where is this founded? What is the root of this idea? It actually comes from one of the most famous verses in the Bible, which probably you've heard and said hundreds of times. And it says you have to love your neighbor like you love yourself. And I've said before, why does it just say love other people? If that's the mitzvah, love other people. It's a very nice idea. How we do it, we'll leave that aside. But love other people, that would be sufficient. But it doesn't say that. It says, love yourself. That, says Rashi, among others, is the root principle that a person is commanded and obligated to try every means possible to improve their self-esteem. See yourself as a special, unique, competent person who has self-worth. Because if you don't love yourself, you're not going to love anyone else. The two ideas are put in the same command because they are contingent one to the other. We have the recha kamocha. Love others like you love yourself. Love yourself is a way you're going to love other people. How are you going to love yourself? That's today's journey, my friends. And that's what we're looking at. One thing is for sure. This self-worth that we are so lacking, and really from all the relationship counseling that I do, I would say that low self-esteem from, this is again, this is my own personal dealing for the past 20 odd years as a rabbi, dealing with couples in trauma relationships. Many of these people have chronic low self-esteem, whether it's nature or nurture, could be something that happened from their past, could be bad relationships, Usually bad parenting, we're going to talk about that today. Bad parenting, and I'm going to define for you good parents, because every parent, once their kids have good self-esteem, the trick we're going to give you over here is going to help you do that as well. Who doesn't want their kids to feel good about themselves and their potential and their greatness? How upsetting is for any parent when a kid turns around and says, oh, I'm terrible at this. What's the first thing we say? Oh, you're great. Doesn't work, though. Have you noticed that? I know it hasn't worked for me. Oh, Abba, I'm so ugly, right? Thought it was there. Oh, I'm not good looking. You know, no, you're beautiful. Doesn't work. The kids don't turn around after you saying that to them. They're like, you know what? I am beautiful. You know what? I am good at math. You know what? I am a great person. Doesn't work. Saying it doesn't work. There is something you can do. It's a true, tried and trusted method to build good self-esteem in your children and yourselves. So we're going to see that today. First of all, though, we have a challenge and the challenge is that we don't have good self-worth and our entire self-worth comes from outside, how other people perceive us. But we just said, you are made, your neshama is inside you. The self-worth we're talking about, the good self-esteem is going to have to come from inside. It's not going to come from outside. That means I know people who are extreme, and you know them too, who are celebrities, who are extremely accomplished, doctors, lawyers, business people. And yet, people tell them all day, you're so amazing, you're fantastic. They hear this from people in their companies, their friends, their family, and yet they have low self-esteem. How could that be? 
Why is it not working when all these people are telling you you're great? You still think you're a shmegegi. You still have low self-worth. And I know people who don't have much competence, who don't get too much admiration from those people around them. They don't have these sycophants and celebrities who, who are surrounded by people telling them how amazing you are. And yet, they have amazing self-worth and good self-esteem based upon what they've done. But it works inside out. You're going to have to fix something in your insides in order to get this right. The first thing is you have a unique mission. You are special and no one else can do what you have. You've been given life for a purpose and you're here for a reason which is greater than you'll ever imagine. Imagine, even if that's not true, which it is, but imagine it's not. Just thinking that every single day when you wake up, when you say, God, you put a soul inside me. My soul is unique. You gave it to me. You gave me this mission and you're infinite. That means my mission is infinite as well. Imagine just going through life thinking that. How great you feel about yourself whilst remaining, remaining humble at the same time. I want to tell you the story of a great biblical character who was known as having excellent self-esteem, who, by the way, had tremendous challenges his entire life. His entire life, he had tremendous challenges and yet had excellent and good self-esteem. And that is King David, David Hamelech. King David had fantastic challenges and had very good self-esteem. And his self-esteem and self-worth got him through these challenges. Let me tell you a story about King David. And you can find it in the book of Samuel, chapter 17, verse 33 to 37. And this story has been told of a lot throughout history. And we know that King David was a small shepherd. And he was the youngest child of a very accomplished family and extremely great father, Jesse, Yishai. And a person had to be chosen to be king of Israel. And King David being the youngest and the little shepherd, and maybe not the greatest of the brothers, we're told, was overlooked by his father. And there was a very telling incident to see how he managed, how King David managed to live up to the potential of being a great and successful leader of Israel. And it goes back to his childhood because the Jewish people were being attacked by a group called the Philistines. They were in Israel and they kept attacking and hurting the Jewish people. Among them was this giant of a man whose name was Goliath, Goliath. And Goliath was an individual who would taunt and attack the Jewish people tremendously. Even Saul, who was the king of his day, couldn't overcome Goliath. Listen to this amazing story. There's a lot of depth and power to this story. Young David came forward at the offer and chance of marrying into King Saul's family at the opportunity to defeat this Goliath. And Saul said to David, you can't fight against this Philistine for you're but a young boy and he's a man of war. And what have you done? You've been a shepherd your entire life. Wow. Now, if there was an attack on a person's self-esteem, you can't beat this guy. He's a man of war. You're a little kid. All you've done is chased sheep around your entire life. You're a nothing. How would most people react to that? How would most people react to hearing that from a king of Israel, no less? You know what? You're right. I'm never going to do it. I've done nothing. He's so much bigger. He's so much better. This Goliath is going to wipe me out. Forget about it. You know what David responds? A response which actually I wouldn't have thought he would ever give. David responded to Saul who said, you're not good enough for this job. And by the way, it's for us too. You're not good enough to be a teacher. Who are you to lecture? Who are you to do this job? Who are you to be a doctor? Who are you to be? You can't do this. You're going to amount to nothing in your life. There's a bigger person than you. Goliaths, plenty of them. They're going to do a better job than you. 
King David said to Saul, your servant was a shepherd for his father. I, you know what? It's true. I've been a shepherd my entire life. Yeah. However, there was a time when a lion, a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. You know what I did? I went out and I chased that bear or that lion away. And if it attacked me, I fought it off. I've killed lions and bears. This guy is nothing to me. I'm going to overcome him and God is going to help me. That was King David's response. Now, I find that rather unusual. You're not dealing with animals right now that you can chase off with sticks and stones. You're dealing with an army led by this big Meshuggah, Goliath. And what does King David say? You're right. What I was, a shepherd. You're right. I can't become CEO of this company. I've got no chance. Right? You're absolutely right. But you know what? I did lead a small company and I did very well over there. And you know what that did? That taught me that I can do anything. And so this big company, this big family, this big project, this big synagogue, whatever it is, is surmountable. Why didn't King David just say, which would have been a fair thing to say as a future leader of Israel, you know what? God will be with me. Because before you trust in God, you need to trust in yourself and believe your own self-worth. Even though you haven't experienced the upcoming test or challenge, makes no difference. You still have the potential based upon your past experience of doing it. Everyone, everyone can look back at their life, no matter how small that achievement is. And in King David's experience, he chased away some animals. That was good enough to be like, you know, I did that. I can do this. I know the two are very far apart from each other. One's an army, one's an animal. But I know from my past that I can do this. And King David became the leader of Israel because he had good self-esteem. People think, of course he had good self-esteem. He was the king of Israel. It's the other way around. He got the job because he had good self-esteem, because he believed in himself. God promoted him. People think, yeah, of course celebrities have good self-esteem. Everyone loves them, right? People make videos about them, send them messages, send them gifts. That doesn't give you good self-esteem. It's the other way around. You become great because you have good self-esteem. It's the other way around. It's got to come from you. And King David dug deep. And you know what? God did help him. But God helps those who help themselves. And the trust in God was after trusting in yourself. And King D. David, King David did that by looking back at his life and said, you know what? People tell me I can't do it. And they say, I've got no chance. I'm not going to succeed. And I'm not going to get this mission done. But you know what? I know I can. Because I did that thing many years ago. It may have seemed small at the time, but it taught me that I have the power potential for absolute greatness. Secret number one. So the concept of being happy with what you have is only going to help you, say the rabbis, when you feel the ability to achieve even greater things. What you have is not going to give you good self-esteem. It just doesn't work that way. If it did, people of lots and lots and lots of money and things would feel very good about themselves. But we know many of them take drugs, most of them, right? The high achievers are getting high a lot of the time because it can't come from outside. It's got to come from inside, seeing the power of the soul and the power of the neshama. We spoke about King Saul. King Saul actually is an example of someone who did have great importance had great importance thrust upon them, was extremely humble, <clears throat> but their humility went too far and he actually lost his position of leadership. He lost his kingship. Actually, kingship left his tribe. 
his tribe of Benjamin were meant to be the kings of Israel, but he lost that. And eventually that went to a different tribe of Judah, that's King David's tribe, because he didn't have good self-esteem. God appeared to Shaul via the prophet and said, you need to wipe out this nation of Amalek. Don't leave anything behind. They're bad people. They're going to hurt us. And you know what happened? Saul did the job, but he was so humble that he was too humble and he didn't feel that he had the ability or the right to kill the leader of Amalek, a guy called Agag, Melech Agag, King Agag. King Agag lived another night because Saul didn't wipe him out. He ended up being able to have children because of that. And Amalek remained with us to this very day. King Saul could have wiped them out. And the prophet approached Saul and said, what did you do? And King Saul said, you know, I didn't feel so good about killing. You know, I killed and we got into war and I did very well. But And the rabbis tell us he failed in his mission and his mission of being king was removed from him solely because he didn't have good self-esteem. He didn't feel he had self-worth. And Samuel said, look at the words of Samuel to the king of Israel. He's the king. Money, power, low self-esteem. Money and power do not equal good self-esteem. It's got to come from yourself. And Samuel said, even if you are small in your own eyes, are you not the head of Israel? Act like a leader. Even if you don't feel. We're getting to our secret, by the way. Even if you don't feel like a leader of Israel, that can complete and has the right and ability and power to fulfill this mission that you've been given this one task, act like you are. Because God made you into a king. You're not only belittling yourself, you are belittling your power and your ability. This divine reprimand to King Saul indicates that in his great piety, and profound humility, which he did have, right? We know from his very early beginnings he had it, but so did King David. King David and King Saul, Shaul HaMelech and David HaMelech, are contrasted in this one major way. Both were great people. King Saul had low self-esteem. King David had great self-esteem. King Saul lost his position of power and King David kept it. And it got to pass it on to next generations. Hold on to that. Because kingship follows the line. And that is self-esteem. God will put you into a position. A position of power. Because he believes you have the ability to achieve it. No matter what it is. For some people it's taking over an entire company. For some people it's just being in charge of a small organization. But everyone has a unique soul mission inside them. You are expected to be successful in this mission and you are expected to lift your own self-worth to get the job done because if you don't, heaven forbid, you become a soul and that position will be taken away from you and given to someone else who can actually finish it. Or you could be like King David, come from the lowest part of the family. He didn't grow up anything special. He was a regular person for a regular family, the youngest of the children, a little shepherd. He did one small thing. His self-worth was good because he realized he had a unique power that was entrusted in him and him alone. And so we've come to our secret. If you stayed with me this far, you get a free glimpse. We touched upon it because the words of Shmuel, Samuel the prophet, actually are the secret that he gave to Saul And even that wasn't enough because at that point, Saul had already failed. And that is, even if you don't have good self-esteem, which most people today don't realize the tremendous latent soul power that they have, the unique, amazing mission that life has given them, they haven't inculcated into themselves the words of the Gemara that Every single life 
Every person should see themselves and say the entire world was made for me. That is the statement of self-worth. A person, says the Gemara and Sanhedrin, should look at themselves and say every day, by the way, saying this will help. You should say it. The world was created for me. Never alone, bishvili. Everything in this world is just for me. Wow. Imagine thinking that every day. Imagine looking in the mirror and saying, I am amazing, which you should do. You should look in the mirror every day and not say, ugh, uh, right, look at this, right? Look at the photos of yourself. Oh, it looks terrible. A person should look at themselves, try it, and say, I am amazing. I have tremendous, unlimited, infinite power because I am a child of God. And that's giving me a soul that is unique and a soul mission that no one else could achieve. You know what the trick is? Fake it. Even if you don't have good self-esteem, which you probably don't, think that you do and just say it and act as though you do. Be humble, but act as though you have good self-esteem. Maybe it's as simple as that. You know how to put good self-esteem into your kids? Telling them they're beautiful, which I do day in, day out. Nothing. It bounces off them. Tell them they're great, bounces off them. Buying them lots of stuff doesn't give them good self-esteem. Trust me, I've tried it with all my kids. You know what gives your kids good self-esteem? And this is the one tried simple hack. Have good self-esteem yourself. Act as though you have, if you haven't, it's contagious. Self-esteem is a contagious disease. Happens to be that it's a good one. Fake it. Act as though you've got good self-esteem. Say it. You know what? I'm pretty good at this. I can take care of this. I'm a good father. I'm a good husband. I'm a good mother. Just say it. Act as though you have. Don't say bad things about yourself. Say the Gemara. Don't say about yourself. A person should not say, I'm a Rasha. Say, you know what? I make mistakes. I'm human. But I'm a good person. I do good. Don't tell me I'm a bad person. I know what I am. I know that in essence I'm a good person. And I think most people today, really, if you were to ask yourselves honestly if you're a good person, you know what, I'm a good person. I make really stupid mistakes, but I'm not defined by my mistakes. And my mistakes, when you look at it in terms of the amount of day you have, right, and the amount of stuff, they're pretty small. And most mistakes we make are pretty fixable for the most part. It may take weeks, months, or years, but they're pretty... Fake it. Say you have good self-esteem. Feel as though you do, you know that you don't. I've said this before. My son says, I'm scared to do things sometimes. I go on a hike with my, I mentioned this story before, but it's a great story. My son had to go climb something, right? And he said, I'm scared. So my initial reaction is, don't be scared. But he is scared, right? It's like telling someone, don't be hungry. They are hungry. I said, be scared. Do it anyway. I hear you're scared, right? You can, don't have to let go of that. Just do it anyway. Same principle applies over here. You know what the simple trick of life could well be? You've got low self-worth. Nothing you can buy, right? Nothing you can say. It's just, nothing anyone else can say is going to build it up. We know it doesn't. People tell me a thousand times you're fantastic. I still don't feel good. Say you're good. Fake it. Pretend to everyone you have good self-esteem. You will. Pretend to your kids and say, you know what, I'm great. I've done some amazing things with my life. And you go, hey, you're an idiot. You're not. Hey, do you know who you're talking to? I've done some pretty good stuff. Do that, your self-esteem will grow. Feel good about yourself. Say good things about yourself. When people say bad things against you which knock you down, answer back. Say, don't say that about me. You know what? I'm pretty good. I'm not perfect. That's humility. Humility is I'm not perfect. There's room for improvement. There always is. But you fake it until you make it. And that's what Samuel said to Saul. He said, you're a king. Act like one. You're a parent. Act like one. You're a business leader, doctor, lawyer. You're a friend. Everyone watching today is a friend. You know what? No one wants friends with low self-esteem. Oh, my life is terrible. How much can you hear of that? Act that way. You'll begin to believe in yourself. And so will your kids. You want your kids to have good self-esteem? Pretend like you have good self-esteem. Although actually, you may not feel as though you'll be able to accomplish this. Did King David really know he was going to beat Goliath? 
course he didn't. But he said, you know what? I've done some great things. God's with me. I think I can do this. And you know what God did? He let him do it. And because of that, he became the king of Israel. Greatness comes from self-esteem. It doesn't become because of it. That, my friends, is the simple mitzvah of Yehafta l'recha kamocha. Love others like you love yourself. If you love yourself, you will love others. And if you love other people, self-esteem goes up. I've overrun my time. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, there will be another presentation taking place at Safra Synagogue. You could be there live. There'll be social distancing and masks. Myself and the other great rabbis of Chazat, New York City, will be speaking. You can see that also online, I think at Torah Anytime. Check out my Facebook and my Instagram for the flyer for tonight's program. I hope you can enjoy us and join us. Thank you all. Have a great and successful week. I will see you all, if not tonight, next year. This Friday night and Saturday night or Rosh Hashanah. So next week, God willing, we'll pick this up with a brand new year and God willing, a brand new you with brand new opportunities that the year will bring us. Thank you very, very much. Shalom, shalom.